Hey y'all, welcome back to the channel. I'm Task Force Bourbon. I'm going to be re-recording a video I made earlier today. I had a bunch of technical difficulties due to apparent connection issues. So if you're watching this and you're uh, uh, you know interested in seeing something new, unfortunately we're gonna have to wait till a little bit later. But what I'm gonna try to try to do is keep a uh, a record of videos that are longer than 60 seconds long for people to enjoy at their leisure. Uh, who, who aren't able to dial into a live video. So today what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to be talking about my top 10 bourbons for beginners uh, that are interested in drinking bourbon neat. Uh, this list that I have uh, is in another post. It's listed in proof order and the intention there is to be drinking it in that order. And what we have uh, is, is uh, start you out small and then work your way up. But before we do that, what we, sh what we should really have is, you know, uh, is a rehash of what bourbon is. So I use something very simple called the ABCs of bourbon. Starting out with the letter A, bourbon can actually be made anywhere in America, right? Although 95% of bourbon is made in Kentucky, uh, mo all bourbon has to be made within America. If it's made outside of America, like Canada or Mexico or wherever else, Europe, it's just gonna be simply whiskey. B, uh, bourbon has to be made in new charred oak, American oak barrels. All right, uh, so that charred piece, it can be charred to different levels of, of degreeing levels. Number one, char is 15 seconds. Number two is 30 seconds. Number three, which is starting to get more common, 35 seconds. And number four, being even maybe even more so common, is 55 seconds. The number four char is also nicknamed the alligator char, and that's because the inside of that uh, oak barrel looks like a, the rough, shiny texture of an alligator skin. So that's number B. C. Corn, it must be made with 51% more corn. The next uh, ingredient in bourbon is nicknamed the flavoring grain, and that's usually rye, uh, can be wheat. If it's wheat, uh, it's nicknamed a wheater bourbon. Uh, and then it's followed by malted barley, which is really what helps bourbon become alcoholic. Um, so there, there are other specialty grains you'll see every once in a while, um, but it has to be 51% or more corn. That's, that, that's one of the rules. D. It must be distilled to a maximum of 80% alcohol by volume or you can double that meaning 160 proof. E, it must enter into the barrel at uh, no more than 62.5% ABV or 125 proof. F, it must be filled or bottled at no less than 40% ABV or 80 proof. Um, I don't know why you would drink anything less than 80 proof personally, but that's uh, one of the rules that's set forth bourbon. And then finally, G, we end with G, it has to be genuine meaning that there can't be anything other than water added to it. So you start adding other things like honey to it, you're gonna be getting a honey whiskey, right? You can finish a bourbon, uh, and we'll get into that maybe a little bit later, but finishing a bourbon you know, is a contentious subject in and of itself. Um, but, but those are the basic tenets uh, or rules or laws, as it were, uh, quite literally laws to be called a bourbon. Going to, into my list to start out first uh, is I have an option, and that's either or. Right, Buffalo Trace uh, from Match Bill Number One, both Buffalo Trace or Eagle Rare. You can choose. Right, the only main difference here really is that the Eagle Rare is aged ten years. As it's an age dated bourbon. <clears throat> These are great entry level bourbons. Um, you know, and I say on this list, the whole point is to have a variety of Match Bills, a variety of distilleries, and then again, increasing in proof um, and, and and giving. Uh, the opportunity to experience bourbon in many different ways. Um, but I want you to start out with something very approachable. And the reason why I have these two as an or option is because of that accessibility part. Every bourbon on this list should be generally affordable, generally accessible. Obviously, that's dependent on means and location. But uh, these, with most Buffalo Chase products nowadays, can be quite difficult to obtain and sometimes can be a little bit on the expensive side. So I'll leave that option to you. I prefer Eagle Rare over the Buffalo Trace, um, but these are great entry level bourbon for most, most people to start out. Okay. <clears throat> um, and they use match bill number one, which is a low rye, which is it's undisclosed match bill, but it's estimated to be about less than 10% rye. So that's a very, usually for most people, an approachable bourbon. Maker's Mark 46. So this bottle is empty because I enjoyed it you know, quite a bit. This is actually a bottle I dipped myself at the Maker's Mark Distillery. And Maker's Mark is a weeded bourbon, meaning that secondary flavoring grain is, uh, you know, the next most um, percentage wise in the mash bill is wheat. And so it's nicknamed the weeder. 
And Maker's Mark 46 is a little bit different than your typical other Maker's Mark or other weeders in the sense that they do something a little bit different. So it starts out as regular Maker's Mark. Then they add in 10 uh, seared French oak staves that are placed into that, that barrel and then age for what's estimated about two to three additional months in limestone cellars. So that gives it something a little bit different. It's not exactly finishing a bourbon, but what this does at a number two spot is one, introduces people to a weeded bourbon, but it also allows individuals to experience bourbon in a different way without really straying too far from those you know, TTB, tra uh, Tax Trade Bureau regulations as, as it pertains to what you know, requirements are uh, lined out to be a bourbon. <clears throat> so in the number three spot, I actually have Old Forester 1897 bottled, bottled in bond, and that's part of their Whiskey Row series. That's one of four bourbons in their Whiskey Row series. I don't have that bottle with me, but I do have a bottle and bond bourbon that I actually wanted to put in that spot. However, um, this is not something that's accessible nowadays, but it is, you know, if I got to choose between the two, this is from Heaven Hill, obviously, it's the namesake, um, bottle and bond uh, bourbon from them. I would put that probably in its stead if it were more accessible. Just a, just a little bit of background on the Bottle and Bond. You know, that's, a, that's out of the Bottle and Bond Act of 1897. That's something that predates the FDA. And it was, a, it was labeled as such because of fear of adulteration out of greed and what have you from people who were uh, adulterating their, their spirits, right? And that was to get a quick buck essentially and, and a little bit uh, connected to the tax law at the time. And so a way to get around that um, and ensure that the consumer and us bourbon you know, lovers were getting spirits that didn't have iodine and tobacco spit and other really disgusting substances in there, out came the Bottle and Bond Act. So to be called Bottle and Bond, what that tells us is a few things. One, it has to be from one distillation se uh, season, which usually runs January to June or July through December, by one distiller uh, at one distillery. If it's other than that, it has to be labeled as such on the bottle. All right, it must be aged for a minimum of four years, and this is the key part, a federally bonded warehouse under U.S. government supervision. Right? <clears throat> now, it doesn't have to be four years, and that's on the nose, and that's done. You can have an old Fitzgerald 16-year bottle and bond, which I have behind me here. I don't know if you can see it. There's right here in the fancy-looking bottle. You, you can also have like the Wild Turkey Masters Keep 17-year bottle and bond, right? So there's no limit on, on age other than you know, minimally it has to be four years old, right? When you see something called straight, for example, um, and I'll skip just for a moment here to you know one of my other selections, you'll see the word straight on this bottle. That tells us it's at least two years, right? That one obviously has a 12 next to it because it's aged 12 years, so that doesn't – same rules apply there in the sense that – uh, it can be aged longer. And then the final rule for the bottle and bond is it has to be aged at exactly 50% alcohol by volume or 100 proof. All right. So that's why, again, that's where it fits and where it does on the list is because it's 100 proof. You went up from, you know, the the uh, the Buffalo Trace at 90 proof, Maker's Mark 46 at 94 proof, and then now you're at 100 proof. So very small increments in, in terms of proof. Um, <clears throat> now with the... Uh, Old Forest 1897, which is, again, this is not it, obviously, right? That's a 72% corn, 18% rye, 10% malted barley mash bill, just for reference. Now, moving into that number four spot, you have Knob Creek 12, right? This one might be a little contentious to some because uh, the 12 year is, for some, maybe a bit oak heavy, right? But now you're getting at about four years old, or you're on your, excuse me, the fourth uh, on the list here. So you should be getting that palette seasoned, pun intended, enough to where you're able to appreciate maybe some of those flavors, flavors without getting on a, on a too, too high at the end of that spectrum. And what I mean by that is for me, again, this is all my channel, my personal preferences, but that age statement for me, I like to look for is between eight to 12 years old. So if you're looking at a label in a store, you can try to find an age statement. They're not required. That's not a requirement, right? Nor is nutrition facts. All right. Um, so for me, it's, it's not a deal breaker, eight to 12 years. Um, four years for me is my personal lowest end of the spectrum I like to look for, with one exception that I found thus far is the Wheel Horse Bourbon, uh, age two years. I thought that was really fine for a two-year bourbon, but that's about the only exception I found to date. <clears throat> um, <coughs> excuse me. So again, the number four spot being that 12-year, you're going to finally experience a little bit of age on your bourbon. 
Now, number five, I don't have a bottle to show you, but it's the Four Roses Small Batch Select, right? That's a 104 proof bourbon, um, you know, and this was 100 proof just for reference. Uh, it's a, a, a high rye bourbon. You got a blend of 75% corn, 20% rye, 5% malted barley, and a 60% corn, 35% rye, 5% malted barley. So when you hear that term high rye, uh, that's a general term, and that can apply to many different things. Um, but, you know, you look at batch bill number two from Buffalo Trace, that's an estimated anywhere between 12 to 15 percent. Um, like this is this is from mash bill number two, Blanton's, right? Uh, mash bill, and they consider that a high rye. That's high rye for them. Now, what I consider high rye is somewhere around you know 18 to 20 percent. You know that that's where you're starting to get really on the higher rye end of the spectrum. You know, <clears throat> from from what I've seen my experiences. But I doubt you'd find anybody who would disagree. Four Roses is a high rye bourbon in general. All right. Now the small batch aspect is something that that that's kind of interesting because that's really the first time in this lineup now you're you're getting something labeled as small batch. Small batch is again very, you know, to be determined on the distillery. You get a small micro distillery that might literally be 10 to 20 barrels or less. <clears throat> and you know, you get something maybe bigger, Jim Beam, you're looking at maybe potentially 200 barrels is a small batch, okay? So, uh, that small batch still it allows a master distiller and their team to be able to provide a consistent brand profile. So if you like that small batch select, you, you can know a couple things about yourself. I know now that maybe I like the higher rye things. Maybe I'm aboard the Four, four Roses cult train and I'm gonna only drink Four Roses. Uh, and, or, and maybe now you can you know go back continuously and get more of that small batch um, you know flavor profile that you liked. <clears throat> and then so, now number six, Russell Reserve Single Barrel. This is a Russell Reserve Single Barrel Selected, meaning a store select. So that's something I look forward to, but only if you know of the store and you can uh, trust that store to have done that store pick correctly. So when you look at a single barrel, you went from small batch, now you're going to single barrel. This is from Wild Turkey. Okay, Russell Reserve is. And a store pick can be done in a, a couple different ways, but generally they're done roughly in one or two ways. One, the distiller, the distillery sends that store, you know, samples and says, hey, here's here's one, you know, pick pick out a two or three, or you don't get a pick at all even. Here you go, here's your thing, bottle it, sell it, make some money, good, good stuff. It's gonna be probably still a really good product even. <clears throat> or you maybe got a smaller store, they went to Kentucky, they sat down with the team and they, they, they went through barrels, went that barrel. It's a single barrel already, but man, that barrel, right? So you can take a product that might be small batch and even go like you see with this Eagle Rare and turn that <clears throat> into a single barrel um, option because they went there and that team said, hey, this is our Eagle Rare stuff set aside for Eagle Rare, but you guys can pick out a barrel, put your marking on, this one's from Total Wine as you can see, and it'll be maybe a bit better. Again, that's dependent on the store, but that's something that's, that's interesting. The single barrel is, is a really fun thing in the sense that it's going to vary wildly from, from barrel to barrel to barrel to barrel or bottle to bottle to bottle. <clears throat> now for the mash bill, this is 110 proof, 5% corn, 30% rye, 12% malted barley. I'm going to put this bottle over here and we'll start talking about one I don't have, unfortunately, again on the table, but that's the old granddad 114 that, that's at 114 proof. That is a definite cult following because it's something you're going to love or hate. This is the first time on this list, if you're riding this you know, sort of escalator up in terms of proof and quality, you've got uh, old granddad is probably one of the first that's going to smack you in the face. Some would consider it a bottom shelf option. That's probably where you're going to find it in the store. It's not very expensive. You're talking like 20 bucks, you know, maybe a little bit more, maybe a little bit less, um, but it's readily accessible. Uh, it's a super high rye bourbon. You're looking at 63% corn, 27% rye, and 10% malted barley. Okay, so if you like that, you're going to get it all day long, and you know you, you can enjoy Old Granddad 114 for the rest of your life, for the most part. Now, when I move into the next on my list, you got Noah's Mill. This is 114.3 proof, so basically the same amount of proof, right? You're talking about a 0.3 proof difference, <clears throat> but unlike the old granddad, which is somewhere around four, maybe five years old. This, uh, it used to be a 15 year age, age stated product, Willet from Willet uh, Distillery. They're technically a craft distillery, but they're probably one of the biggest craft distilleries that you'll see. Um, this uh, lost that age statement, but we do uh, all but know this is a blended bourbon 
uh, which includes bourbons from four to 20 years old and includes a variety of mash bills from high rye and weeded mash bills. So this is a really wild, crazy option. And what's really cool here is you're gonna see old granddad 114 against you know Noah's Mill, right? Basically, right one after the other, and you're gonna see how night and day bourbons can be from one another in terms of you know distilleries and the mash bill. So you're you're gonna really be able to appreciate that. Um, I'll uh, I'll try to get to some questions in a moment. Um, I'm just gonna get through the rest of the list here, and then I'll fill those at the end. So I'm not not putting anybody off here. So. We're moving into number nine now. That's the Old Forester 1920. That's something that's beloved in the bourbon community right now and is definitely one of my personal favorites. So starter or not, this is, this is a fantastic bourbon. Again, it's a part of their Whiskey Row series. This is one of four. Um, and it, my, again, my favorite on that you know, whole series there and one of my top ten probably favorite bourbons of all time. I, I, I truly enjoy it. <clears throat> this goes up to 115 proof. It's a Prohibition style that was developed with uh, the prohibition style of bourbon in mind um i would probably go out on a limb and and say that that's probably not necessarily true in actuality if we went back in you know in, in time and tasted bourbon from back then but only one could could guess right we none of us have a time machine um but but they have done their homework and they say it is as a such and it's a fantastic bourbon anyway so Definitely one I recommend, and uh, we're looking at, for this one, 72% corn, 18% rye, 10% malted barley. So now we're at the final leg of the journey. All right, by now, you've had you know, Buffalo Trace, Maker's Mark, Old Forester, Jim Beam, Wild Turkey, Willet, um, and you've gotten everything from a high rye to a wheat to a single barrel to a small batch. Um, the only thing really that you really haven't had at this point, and this is another option choice, is a barrel proof op, uh, option. And what I've provided to you is both products from Heaven Hill, because that's the last really significant Kentucky distiller that, that's not been on this list uh, as of yet. And <clears throat> this is a weed of bourbon, Larceny is, and Elijah Craig is not, right? So the match bills change because you're looking at different batch numbers. As you'll note, very small here written down is a batch number. And the same thing is true for this one as well. There's a batch number right here. This one says A121. Okay, that A means it's the first batch. So there's A and a B and a C of this year annually, annual you know, uh, release as it were, with the one standing for January and the 21 standing for 2021. So you'll see like B521, C921. Okay, and from being from both from Heaven Hill, that's gonna be true for both of these. Um, but, <clears throat> I gave these again as an option because these can become a little bit difficult in terms of accessibility. Um, they are going to be on the probably the highest end of the price spectrum that you've experienced thus far on this list. With these ranging somewhere sitting around about a hundred bucks, you might see them a little less. <clears throat> you know, anywhere from you know I've, I've heard 60, 70 bucks to 120, maybe a little bit more. But generally, I'm going to sit that, set that price somewhere around about a hundred bucks. Um, these are these are great bourbons, and they're going to allow you to experience a bourbon at barrel proof. <clears throat> so, going into some more label aspects that you're looking for, we talked about age statements. All right, we haven't really talked touched on uh, non chill filtered. So you'll see this big old black print Russell Reserve is super proud non chill filtered. So most bourbons are actually chill filtered. So the metaphor I like to look back to is like if you look at maybe having uh, macaroni and cheese you put it in the fridge you know you, you bring it back over it's got a little bit of that film on top the fat has risen up and um you know when you heat, heat that back up it just tastes even more delicious for some some reason well that that's that that's those fatty you know acid esters and, and other things that are helping to give those flavor compounds that we know and love chill filtration removes that that used to be done uh, more so for the point of you know having you know some of the impurity like you know, specs and whatnot removed from within inside. <clears throat> now, that used to be a major concern when you had distilleries, you know, maybe producing things that you couldn't, you know, a distiller that you couldn't trust and producing stuff where maybe there's something in it, it shouldn't be. But nowadays, that's really not such a, such a big issue when you got such reputable distillers doing great things. And a non shale filtered bourbon allows us to get the most amount of, you know, flavor in there. So when I'm looking for a bourbon, I'm looking, like I said, age dated eight to 12 years. Um, Filtration, non-chill filtered. Although it's not a, um, it's not a deal breaker 
right? If it's not, because again, most aren't, but I'm definitely, I'm avoiding personal preference. I'm avoiding the Tennessee whiskey, the charcoal filtration. I really believe that that strips a lot of those flavors that, that I know and love. So that, that might be a bit of an upset to some viewers, but I, I'm not a charcoal filtered fan. Now location, I like the bourbon belt. Um, and that's, you know, Kentucky, Indiana, or MGP, Midwest Grain Products, or Tennessee, right? But what you're looking for is distilled in on, on the bottle, not bottled in. It'll say distilled in or versus bottled in. This one, like you see here on the back of the Russell Reserve, <clears throat> if I can get it in the screen, it says on the very bottom here, distilled and bottled in Kentucky. Actually, it says Lawrenceburg, Kentucky. Now, again, this is not uh, a deal breaker because there are fantastic bourbons um, all over the place, um, all across America. As long as it's built, you know, made in America, distilled in America, you're, you're good to go. And meets all those other ABCs we talked about earlier. Proof, 90 proof, 90 proof or higher is my personal preference. But again, uh, not a deal breaker. I love barrel proof stuff. Um, you go all the way up to about 140. Uh, where that's starting to be nicknamed something called hazmat because that's really really high in proof I, I don't recommend this is a starter video for starters, but you know people getting interested in drinking bourbon neat um, And you want to do so, you know at room temperature You know you can add water to it if you want because that's really what helps cut that proof from 140 to 90 or wherever They want to set that 107 whatever uh, water is fine. Ice is something that will that cold will affect those flavor molecules, and that's something you want to avoid. So if you want to lower that proof, it's a little uh, a little too rough. Add a couple drops of water. Add a whole dropper of water. That's fine. Just stay away from the ice and the, and the cold. If you're really looking to appreciate that bourbon and that flavor in its in its entirety and its you know most truest form. Store select. <clears throat> Touched on that a little bit from a reputable distiller usually means non-franchise, unfortunately, um, but that's not always true either. Like the, the Total Wine, I found to be a pretty good place. Liquor Barn, another good place that does some stuff. Um, mash bill, typically those, let me grab a bottle here. Sorry, I just jumped off screen, but we have, this was out of uh, Denver, Colorado, Mythology. They list their mash bill on the side. This is definitely not something that's very common in bourbons, but you can see here that they list their mash bill in its entirety. Now, some on, online internet sleuthing, you can figure that out on your own, but like you, this one says, you know, this, it's a blend of three bourbons, 15 year, a five year, and a two year, and the 15 years from Kentucky and the others are from Indiana. The Kentucky bourbon says 78.5% corn, 13% rye, 8.5% malted barley. It does the same thing to list out <clears throat> those other bourbon mash bills. That's not a deal breaker. That's far from it because that's, fairly uncommon in actuality so um, but but it does help you as a consumer of bourbon to be able to identify what you start to like right so take some notes um, because you won't find that again to be true for most bottles but if you're taking notes in your own little journal or whatever you can then you're going to be able to um, discover what you know preference you have and seek out others like it and then finally extra information all right, so you got extra information, you know, like a single barrel option. <clears throat> you can see what, like Blanton's, obviously it's really well known. Yeah, it's actually famous for being where, you know, Asian warehouse age, but you can see like what warehouse it's in. You can see <clears throat> um, maybe what Rick house it was on. You can see other notes, like if it's been toasted, all right, or if it has a specialty grain like brown rice in it. Um, if it's double oak, right, it's been aged in yet another oak to, to get even more of that oak you know, flavors. Uh, it's been finished. So again, that finished bourbon is a bit contentious uh, in the bourbon community as whether or not it actually follows those TTB regulations. Um, I'm on the, the, in the camp of saying it does. Um, so we got like, here's a prime example of a finished bourbon is we have a Thomas S. Moore. <clears throat> this one is a prime example of a finished bourbon. You can see right there, it says finished in port casks. Right, and so this isn't a a, a a a deal breaker for me as well, but it's something that's definitely deserves to be said. It's in its own category, and you can see things like port, uh, cabernet, um, you know, and then you got good time stuff, aging, you know, barrels that used to have hold honey. So as long as the flavor was not directly added to it, right. It is still a bourbon as long as, but they have to say it's been finished in. So again, uh, we can save the finished discussion for a later time, but you know, no, those are out there. And, and as long as they meet all the other rules, they can still be called bourbon legally. Um, but 
But really, that's <clears throat> that's sort of the uh, the list that I've laid out for starter, you know, uh, individuals interested in getting into drinking bourbon neat. Um, I'll field some questions now. I'm sorry I postponed us to last. So, <clears throat> Giuseppe three two one asks, uh, what is the best bang for buck for someone getting into whiskey? So. I, I recommend that you would follow this list um, getting into whiskey. So there's a saying really that some of us bourbon individuals, uh, you know, guys, gals alike will say that you can drink bourbon any damn well you please. Um, and uh, whether that means drinking it with Coke, fine. To me, as long as you drink bourbon, that's great. Um, you know, I don't appreciate when I see bourbon just sitting on someone's shelf. Right, but as long as you're drinking it, that's on you. But for for someone just getting into in bourbon and whiskey, I think follow this list because what you're going to be able to do is find a way to appreciate that bourbon in the way that it was meant to to be appreciated. There's a lot of effort and energy that goes into this, especially when you get into something that's maybe aged 20 years, it just sat there for 20 years, or you know it was finished in triple finished. Right, that's a lot of extra effort. It was that that and then toasted, or you know it has. You know, crazy mash bills or single barrel or master's distiller selected, you know, thing that meant that, you know, someone with a lot of expertise has went and found a singular barrel that's that's supposed to be amazing. So look for these things on, on the labels to help guide you. Use this list if you want. You know, if you if you are just getting into bourbon and you try this list, I'd be really excited to hear your feedback. Um, and uh, uh, if you have... If you're a seasoned drinker and you have some changes you might make, I'd be eagerly uh, awaiting to hear what you have to say as well. Um, let's see. Does we have any other questions on there? Nope. Uh, your Drew Brass arrived. So always wanted to try that Heaven Hill. You know, you're welcome to sample anytime, buddy. <clears throat> um, Old Forester Statesman uh, uh, from Bourbon Bound. Another fantastic bourbon. Uh, from Old Forester, uh, really, it's it's hard to go wrong with those guys. But again, that's a personal opinion. Start with this, take notes, and then uh, branch out. Right um, for 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 everybody else, you know, tuning in. I thank thank you all for tuning in again, and uh, I look forward to hearing feedback. And cheers.